This is The Doorstep. Sponsored by the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. Featuring Nicholas Kabosta, Tatiana Serafin, and Mohamed Bazi. This episode was recorded on October 22nd, 2020. Welcome to today's episode three of The Doorstep. We have so much to talk about since the last time, um, bringing the news to you that you may have missed. Uh, and news that you can use in your everyday decision making. Um, today, uh, we are go- joined with by a special guest, um, Professor Mohamed Bazi from New York University, who is going to be sharing his thoughts um, on the Middle East and how news and events and actions in that region are affecting our lives here in the US, in Main Street USA. Um, as always, we want to hear from you, so please do share your comments. Um, after the podcast. Uh, And I want to welcome also Nick back to the podcast, who um, will be uh, discussing a very important Senate foreign relations report that came out uh, yesterday about what the future might look like in American foreign policy. Uh, So welcome, Nick and Mohammed. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So uh, I'm Nick Vozdev, joining uh, my co-host Tatiana Serafin at this issue of The Doorstep. And uh, to start off with, uh, yesterday, the Democratic staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, released uh, a report, The Cost of Trump's Foreign Policy, Damages and Consequences for U.S. and Global Security. And what's interesting about this report is it very much takes uh, to heart the concept that we have here behind the doorstep, which is that foreign policy can't just simply be about moving pieces on the chessboard uh, of grand strategy, but how does this connect to the needs, concerns, uh, interests, and values uh, of American citizens? To what extent has the Trump administration helped or hurt what uh, Americans think to be important about foreign policy and what are some of the ways uh, moving forward? Uh, And Senator uh, Bob Menendez, the ranking member of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, discussed the release of this report uh, in a discussion moderated by uh, Nahal Tusi of Politico, who was our guest uh, on the second uh, edition of The Doorstep. Uh, And what was interesting was uh, that uh, the senator uh, sounded some of these key themes uh, of uh, that we have to connect to the needs of the of the uh, quote unquote ordinary uh, American citizen. They have to see benefits from what America does in the world. But more importantly, he really attached this question of values uh, that Americans want a foreign policy that they believe is rooted in American values related to democracy and free expression, free expression uh, and individual liberties. Uh, and that we need to prioritize working with other democracies, pushing back against the tide of authoritarianism. Where this may play out, uh, and this goes back to the first issue, uh, first edition of the doorstep, uh, is he called out the technology question that uh, citizens of the United States and our democratic partners in Europe and Asia, it's not enough to condemn what China does and to be concerned about Chinese digital networks and the 5G networks and social media apps, but that we then have to redouble our efforts to uh, provide alternatives. And I thought it was interesting that he he called that that point out. Uh, But what was also interesting was that uh, the bulk of the uh, question and answers in the uh, discussion revolved around the Middle East, which uh, speaks to what polling data suggests is still the region of the world, uh, despite the rise of China, despite the resurgence of Russia, uh, the Middle East is still that part of the world uh, that captures the attention of Americans. They see or, or perceive threats emanating from the region, whether from extremist organizations or from Iran. Uh, they are looking at the question of potential uh, with regard to are there going to be breakthroughs in in the peace process. Uh, And there's still a sense that what happens in this part of the world has a direct impact 
on their sense of peace and security uh, at home. And so it was interesting that although China came up, uh, the bulk of the discussion still revolves uh, around the Middle East, which makes it uh, a fortuitous uh, uh, timing that uh, we are discussing the Middle East uh, in this session uh, of the doorstep. Uh, and again, right before uh, the election where to the extent foreign policy has featured uh, or has found its way into uh, the election campaign, uh, the Middle East remains one of those uh, topics, uh, either for the public at large, but also for uh, specific interest groups and voting blocks uh, within the United States. Um, I think uh, that's so interesting, Nick, and you're absolutely right. From um, word on the street interviews that I've been doing, it's it's clear that that view that of, of America's strength and projecting its strength is clearly on the street seen as happening in the Middle East. Would you agree, Mohammed? Um, is there strength? Does the US come from a position of strength in the region? Can you talk to us about uh, Trump's fragmented policy in the, in the Middle East um, and what he has or has not accomplished over the last few years? Uh, thank you both. Um, I, I think, Nick, it, it's, it's very interesting the, the themes that you laid out that emerge uh, from this Senate foreign policy report. I would add uh, the one element as you laid these themes out, the one element that felt missing to me out, out of the report um, is just the enormous media attention that stories in the Middle East receive. Um, and, and I would argue that that's one major reason uh, that it's on the minds of so many Americans. Uh, the other major reason has to do with Tatiana's question of uh, projection, projection of strength, and um, you know that would be the presence of U.S. troops in the Middle East, um, and that's one place where Trump's fragmented policy toward the region, and probably his his entire uh, fragmented foreign policy, um, that's one place we can probably see it most clearly. Um, that here Trump campaigned on the idea of withdrawing US troops from all of uh, these foreign conflicts, all of, all of these wars that um, the US has been involved in since uh, September 11th, 2001. Um, and of course, as previous presidents found out, that is much easier said than done. Um, and the US continues to be entangled in um, multiple foreign conflicts um, in the Middle East, it's uh, Iraq, uh, the presence of several thousand U.S. troops there, um, Syria, where there's a, 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 lo a lower number of troops, we're probably in the hundreds, maybe up to a thousand. We've never really had a clear sense of the level of U.S. troops, partly because the Pentagon um, stopped sharing those numbers. Um, and then going outward uh, into Afghanistan, the, the other country where there is a significant U.S. troop presence. Um, so. That's certainly, I'd argue, that's one of the reasons, one of the major reasons that um, the U.S. public sees the Middle East as integral and vital to U.S. foreign interests. Um, the presence of those troops, the enormous um, media attention that is focused on these countries and on the conflicts in these countries. Um, and, and I think that's the the major reason it's such an important part of the American psyche. It's so interesting that you also mentioned media attention. Uh, one of the stories that I've been following is the controversy over the New York Times podcast, The Caliphate. And I think that it encompasses what you're saying, this idea that Americans have that we're invested in the region because we're trying to fight an other whatever and however the, uh, the U.S. populace sees as that other. Um, and the Caliphate was a podcast the New York Times debuted in 2018 um, based on uh, uh, interviews uh, with primarily one person who had claimed to be um, a fighter for ISIS and was giving the reporter Rukmini Kalimachi information about um, terrorism and the organization. And the way that the podcast played out over 10 episodes was this very dramatic, um, well, as someone put it, fear sells. Uh, 
uh, fear cells, the fear of Islam, the fear of Muslims. Um, and, and this is how uh, episode by episode was built into with very vivid and graphic scenes. Um, if you listen to the podcast of what ISIS was doing um, until, of course, last month in a story that went under the radar, um, the Canadian piece arrested uh, the uh, Sheikh Rosi Chaudhry, who was her primary source for this series. Uh, and now it is in the New York Times and many media watchers are seeing as the New York Times is reflecting on how the story is reported and what it means and how the New York Times may have played into this media frenzy over the Middle East and also media exploitation a little bit, Mohammed, do you think so? Yes, I think that the, the case um, that's unfolding right now over the caliphate and um, the Times is reporting and presentation of that podcast um, does build into this um, sentiment we, we saw. It. it it feels long ago. You're talking about 2018, which is only two years ago. But <laughs> uh, in the crush of news we've faced since November 2016, since that presidential election, that fateful election, um, it it almost it does feel long ago, and it, it, you almost can't quite. I think all of us follow all of us on this show right now follow international news pretty closely. I think, and and I imagine it feels far off for all of us because there's been so much, um, and and we can't quite grasp that time when ISIS was in the news every day, um, and when this concern that somehow ISIS was going to reach America, um, I, think, I think that was one of the central problems of the coverage. This fear that um, it, was, it was striking Europe, that there were these cells, uh, which, which there were. Um, there were many European fighters, uh, volunteers, people who were recruited from the disaffected Muslim communities in various um, European countries uh, to go to Syria and Iraq to be part of the caliphate as ISIS presented itself um, and uh, to be trained and, and to be involved in those wars there and, and then in several cases to be sent back to Europe and to carry out terrorist attacks inside Europe. Um, and some of the coverage in the US um, hi highlighted that and, and went, went into that phenomenon, that pattern, which is important to explore. Uh, but there was a byproduct of it, which was, uh, that soon ISIS, the sense that ISIS would, would reach America, that it would strike Americans in their homes in, in the same way that um, it was striking fear in Europe. And, and I think that's, that's one place where the problems emerged. Um, and, and one place where the coverage didn't quite stand up to scrutiny, and um, be, partly because of this desire to reach for the most sensational characters and the most sensational stories. Um, and, and that was where Caliphate and that was where that uh, journalist Rukmini Kalamashi was sort of, was tripped up the, in, in this particular case. There, are, there were also some um, problems in some of the other coverage um, she had done for the New York Times as several media observers um, have noted. The New York Times right now is um, doing an investigation and re-evaluating the reporting that went into the Caliphate podcast, um, is having a team of editors and reporters uh, pour over all of that reporting and to see what went wrong in the, in the reporting of that massive. It was, a, it was a major undertaking that the New York Times spent about a year working on, a, a whole team of reporters and editors. Yeah, and what do you think that it this um, though it has kind of run its course, it seems as an, a headline. Do you think that it has impacted or resurfaced kind of American fears towards ISIS? You know, there is a trial of two ISIS fighters going on, and then it, on Friday we heard the news um, that outside of um, Paris, um, a teacher, um, what a middle school teacher, um, had been killed. Um, by um, a uh, Chechen refugee who was upset with the discussions and portrayal of Muhammad in the teacher's classes. And so, um, you know, is this fear coming back that you mentioned and this frenzy coming back? I mean, is this a way that, you know, Trump can play to his strength in the region? Do you, do you see that happening in the, as an October surprise, if you will, before the election? 
I think that's, I think we're past that point, uh, partly because of um, everything else that has happened and, and partly because uh, coronavirus dominating the, the news and dominating our lives for the last eight months or so, um, that, that the fear of ISIS is under the surface. But because ISIS has been effectively defeated as, a, as an organization that controlled large um, territory, large territory in, in Iraq and in Syria, where it was able to carry out its operations. Um, so without holding that territory, um, it's, it's been difficult. There are remnants of ISIS still in, uh, mostly in parts of Iraq. Uh, they're, not, they're not as present in Syria. Um, but, but those remnants are there. They have carried out some attacks um, that uh, have killed the Iraqi civilians and, and some members of the Iraqi security forces. And I think that speaks to the deeper fact underlying all of this, which is that ISIS uh, killed far, far more Muslims, um, far more people in Iraq and in Syria um, and in the Middle East and in, in the wider Muslim world than it ever killed in Europe. Um, and, and there was always a disconnect between the hysteria around ISIS's impact and the ways it was going to reach Europe and eventually the U.S. Um, and the death toll that it would uh, impose in, in these places. And, and that's, that's at the basis of this hysteria. It, it affected the Middle East. It affected those countries uh, much more directly, the places where it was operating in, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, the death toll was enormous there. Uh, due to ISIS, and it never reached that level of uh, power and influence in in Europe and in the U.S. Um, I wonder, I, Nick might have some thoughts on this as well. You. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that this comes back to larger questions of perceptions of threat versus reality, uh, and and then the question. I mean, tying it back into the New York Times and the Caliphate. Uh, uh, podcast and blog is uh, things that then diminish the credibility of the media outlets that are charged with reporting, right? You know, is, are there going to be, you know, the New York Times uh, and other institutions, if they, if their coverage of events is then, is being open to challenge, this then opens up the space as we've seen uh, in the last election and in this election, uh, for people to question uh, whether or not what is being reported is accurate. Uh, it opens up the space for disinformation uh, to creep in. Uh, it opens up the space for uh, what actually is happening on the ground matters less than the perception that people believe. And again, tying it in just to the Middle East theme that you know we had you know reports that uh, you know, hackers tied to the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran uh, have been, uh, you know, essentially impersonating uh, Proud Boy members uh, to send threatening emails uh, to uh, potential uh, Joe Biden, uh, Kamala Harris voters. Uh, and again, the, the, the idea of where do you turn to for trusted information? Why does this region matter? Uh, how do you separate uh, you know, the, the noise from what's actually happening on the ground. And then again, back to why does it matter? Uh, you know, you, if you're going to say that the United States, I think this is coming back to as well as the United States uh, and, and the, the public as a whole has seen a massive investment uh, of, of certainly of treasure and then for members of the volunteer military, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the loss of blood uh, to be involved in different spots in the Middle East because people were told that this, if, if we're not there, bad things will happen here. Uh, and I think you've had people beginning to question that. Is that the case? If, if we leave Syria, if we leave Afghanistan, uh, is, does this necessarily mean that there are problems in the U.S.? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, that then begins, I think, to flow back into this. Uh, and some of this, though, in the end comes back to uh, where are people getting their information and how are they forming their impressions to the extent that they are following this closely. But even if they aren't, uh, people still, you know, Tatiana, going back to your uh, opening point, people, uh, even if they aren't Middle East experts, uh, 
all seem to have an opinion about what's happening there. Where are they getting those impressions from? Who is shaping them? How accurate are they? And then, you know, what are the, what are the policy impacts? So did either of you see the press conference last night um, when uh, John Radcliffe came out, you know, very briefly and said, here's what happened and then didn't take questions and left. So to your point, how are people getting information? It's difficult to get information when not much information is given. So you're left then with either looking at disinformation, right? People just promoting theories online or a lack of information. Um, so when we look at the potential next four years, Nick and Mohammed, from a perspective of if Trump wins, what might happen in the Middle East in the next four, four years versus if Biden wins, what might happen in the Middle East in the next four years? Thoughts on the next four years, if we can look ahead? Um, I, I think for, for the Middle East, I mean, most I expect most people, most countries in the Middle East uh, don't want Trump to win these next four years, probably with two very notable exceptions, uh, Saudi Arabia and, and the United Arab Emirates uh, that have been the, the closest allies of the Trump administration. Um, I mean, Mohammed bin Salman and Saudi Arabia would be very pleased if Trump won, as would uh, Mohammed bin Zayed in, um, in the UAE. And... Um, Aside from those two leaders, um, I think most other leaders, well, maybe CC in Egypt also would be pleased that uh, that Trump would win. Uh, as a, as a whole, I expect people, populations of the Middle East, um, would would be worried about another four years um, of an administration that has largely gone along with um, Saudi UAE priorities in the region um, when it comes to Arab world allies, um, and then Israel's priorities in the region, and, and especially the Netanyahu government's priorities in the region. Um, and that, we, 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 we've um, also lost sight a bit in, in the crush of news of the past weeks and, and months um, of the significance of the UAE um, and Bahrain um, signing the Abraham Accords, uh, the deal with um, with Israel, you know, trumpeted by the Trump administration as as a huge accomplishment. Um, it was important. It it did put on paper a reality that already existed on the ground. Um, you know, as if I were to make a prediction, if Trump wins, um, I think we would likely see Saudi Arabia added to that list of countries that. Um, sign an agreement. It's not really a peace deal since the countries weren't at war. Um, but and and I think Mohammed bin Salman would wait until he ascends uh, to the throne, until he becomes king, to be able to do that because his father has resisted uh, the idea so far to make a deal with Israel. Uh, but 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 Trump would probably out that as uh, as the greatest accomplishment ever um, in in the Middle East. Uh, but on the negative, on the very negative side, we would um, continue to have uh, tensions with Iran, um, a, a fragmented and confused policy regarding Iran, uh, one that just uh, seems to highlight uh, punishment and economic sanctions and uh, this idea that the regime in, in Iran can be forced and humiliated into negotiations. Um, and um, it, I think it will just continue uh, trouble throughout the region. Um, we would likely, we're already seeing steps toward a U.S. withdrawal from Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of Iran's highest priorities and, um, and an interesting contradiction in that um, this, this was one of the main uh, goals of uh, Major General Qasem Soleimani uh, to get U.S. troops out of Iraq, uh, and by his death, he would likely have accomplished that um, because we're already seeing this winding down of, of U.S. troops who no longer want to be the target of, uh, of the Iran-backed militias in Iraq. Uh, we're also seeing a potential move to uh, shut down the U.S. embassy in Baghdad uh, 
one of the largest U.S. embassies in the world. Um, there was a huge investment of money and effort and lives lost to building that embassy and to establishing that presence. Um, and untangling all of that without any apparent policy um, for what the U.S.-Iraqi relationship would look like under Trump. So I'm not optimistic. I, th I think uh, a lot, first of all, depends on who wins the presidency uh, in, you know, whether or not we have a second term Trump administration or a first term Joe Biden administration. If it's a first term Joe Biden administration, then a lot depends on uh, how that administration is staffed out. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things from last week that uh, our, our guest then, um, uh, Nahal had pointed out was uh, that, uh, you know, there is competition within the Democratic Party for shaping the direction of the Biden administration. Where does that come through on the Middle East? So returning back to uh, Senator Menendez yesterday, uh, you know, it, what would a Democratic administration do differently? Would it be more willing to uh, enforce human rights standards on uh, allies of the U.S. that are autocratic in nature? And what would cause them, would that cause them to accept this as criticism from the U.S., whether in Egypt or Saudi Arabia? Will it cause them to turn more to Russia to counterbalance? Uh, what happens uh, in terms of uh, whether or not a Biden administration chooses to reenter or to seek to reenter the Iran nuclear deal uh, versus a Trump administration, which despite its talk about wanting a quote unquote better deal, uh, seems more or less intent on regime change uh, in Tehran, even if it's not by use of the U.S. military, but just essentially using economic pressure to to cause a collapse of the uh, of the regime. Uh, obviously, two very different directions. But particularly, also an interesting note for Generation Z, which tends to you know want to focus on when it thinks about foreign policy or global policy to focus on wide-ranging issues such as climate change. Uh, climate change, the policies that are taken on climate change in the next four years have an impact on our Middle East policy. Uh, if uh, Joe Biden, despite some of his campaign rhetoric in Pennsylvania, uh, accedes to some of the demands of the more progressive slash environmental wing of the Democratic Party, uh, and therefore uh, really seeks to put new limits and restore Obama era limits on uh, US oil and natural gas production. Um, we aren't going to be able to immediately pivot to green technologies. So there'll be a gap where we need oil uh, and gas. Uh, if we're not producing it uh, and we restrict how much we're producing, then the Middle East becomes important again. Uh, even if we're not the direct importers, but because a, a greater source of the world's supply comes from the Middle East. Now, last year, the Trump administration was just a, a, a kind of one-off from Donald Trump, uh, but essentially said, we don't really need to secure the free flow of energy from the Middle East anymore for ourselves or for our allies because we can source it. Uh, it's a bit, uh, I think, a bit... Uh, you know, overestimating how much the U.S. could supply world markets, but that was a sea change after 40 years of, of the Carter Doctrine saying keeping Middle East oil flows open is no longer necessarily a security uh, issue of the U.S. Well, that depends on how much is being produced domestically. So domestic environmental policy could cause us to re-engage. The other thing that'll be interesting is uh, Donald Trump wants to continue this haphazard withdrawal from the Middle East, uh, but that, uh, you know, Joe Biden, uh, will the real Joe Biden step up? Uh, because now we're being told that, well, Joe Biden really had opposed the Libya intervention in 2011. He was a proponent of a very light footprint for Afghanistan. He didn't support the surge. Uh, he just wanted to essentially keep a very minimal counterterrorism force. Uh, would we see either a second term Trump or a first term Joe Biden administration trying to uh, to reduce the U.S. military footprint in the region? And what would that do with 
uh, existing allies and, and, and the like. And then finally, of course, uh, despite, you know, I don't see a Biden administration, if they were to come in, reversing some of the decisions the Trump administration has taken vis-a-vis -vis Israel uh, and the Palestinian territories, uh, the status of Jerusalem, uh, the status of the Golan Heights, uh, other things. And so would a Joe Biden administration have a fundamentally different approach uh, than the Trump administration uh, when it comes to Israel? And how much of that will depend on whether or not uh, Netanyahu remains as prime minister versus uh, at some point the Israeli uh, opposition coming to power? And similarly, if I'm uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, I must be worried to some extent uh, about trying to get a read of what would a uh, Joe Biden administration mean for uh, my plans for the region, my vision for Saudi Arabia's development, but also how that plays out vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, and so I think that these are questions that uh, we can pose today, uh, but we're not going to know the answers, not even after November 3rd. And in many cases, we may not know the answers until uh, next year, either with seeing who staffs a second term Trump administration, uh, because so many key positions right now are, are not staffed or people are leaving. Uh, and then, of course, if it's a Joe Biden administration coming in, uh, who gets the nod? Uh, who will be appointed to those key uh, foreign policy and national security positions. Uh, and then we'll have a better idea next year. So we don't have the answer. Mohammed, do you have a sense of how B Biden is perceived in the region, how people are viewing the election and what's going on in the U.S.? I, I think Biden is viewed much in the same way he's viewed here, uh, which is a stabilizing force, uh, a return to um, norms of U.S. foreign policy and uh, a less erratic behavior. Um, and, uh, you know, Nick laid out the, the key issues very succinctly, um, but, but there is some hope that um, he, he would return to elements to the Iran deal, whether entirely or um, elements of it. I mean, the, the a counterpoint to that is that uh, you know Iran is going to make more demands this time. It's not going to be so quick to trust um, a U.S. administration or U.S. president the, the the signature of anyone on the U.S. or, or the commitment of any U.S. official this time uh, because of what Trump did and uh, shattering that norm of respecting previous. Uh, U.S. deals and treaty, uh, well, not a treaty, but the U.S. Uh, deals and uh, reached with the past administrations. So um, it's going to be, it's, it's not, it wouldn't be an easy negotiation. Um, in, in some ways, Iran and its allies in the region, um, I would put Assad, the Assad regime in, in Syria, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and a few others in that list, uh, they're looking for breathing space under a Biden administration in, in a way they haven't had, uh, certainly in the last year or two under the Trump administration. Um, and I think one of the things we're seeing, for example, the delay in forming a government in Lebanon, um, I think that's partly driven by um, Iran and, and others, the Gulf countries as well, waiting to see what happens with the U.S. election. I mean, yeah. Lebanon has its own dynamics, and we would need to spend an entire show to get through those. Um, but that's one of the factors driving that delay. And, and uh, today, actually, uh, Saad Hariri was named again. I guess this would be his potentially his fourth time as prime minister. Uh, so he's the prime minister who resigned a year ago at the start of the popular protests. Um, continued to serve as a caretaker for a few months, then was replaced uh, by another prime minister, um, who has then later that prime minister and his cabinet resigned after the Beirut port explosion. Uh, and now Hariri is back and tasked with forming a new government. Um, and that's, that's a sign that at least the factions are coming to some agreement. Um, he, he, probably does have the support of Iran. I imagine he does because uh, Hezbollah seems to be ready to sign off on his nomination. Um, and, and that's all the different ways that the region is waiting 
um, for this election and, and to see the outcome. Um, and, and basically to see how a Biden administration would plot, I think Nick, Nick is right, it, we would need to look to who is appointed in those t uh, key positions, who staffs these positions, who creates the day-to-day -day policy. Um, and I, I wouldn't expect radical change. Um, he, he would not undo, I agree with Nick, he, Biden and his administration would not undo the deals that were reached between Israel and the Gulf, he's ex already expressed support for them. Um, on the Golan, I wonder if he would, is that that is something important to resolving the Syrian war and Syrian crisis. I wonder if he would try to find some leverage with a non-Netanyahu administration. Um, but on those questions of what's been achieved so far, he, he would probably continue. Um, I think the left, the American left, will be really looking at how a Biden administration um, deals with autocrats in the region, deals with the CCs, deals with MBS, uh, deals with the Yemen war, which started under the Obama administration. And despite the protests of so many Obama era officials that they tried their best, uh, they went along with that war for the first two years. They continued to arm Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the early years of that war. Um, and I think the, the left progressive elements of the Democratic Party are going to be looking very closely at um, what a Biden administration does on Yemen, what it does on uh, weapons sales to those regimes in the Arab world. Um, and that could potentially be a really difficult early test for a Biden administration. Um, that is an excellent point, um, bringing up the progressives and on this younger, because they are driven by this younger generation and different thinking, um, Gen Z thinking that we've been talking about, young millennial thinking, driven by AOC, Ilan Omar. Um, and it is a very much a wait and see, um, wait and see. So we're going to wait and see about the debate tonight. And we are going to wait and see about November 3rd. Our next podcast will be after the election. And I'm sure we'll have more to talk about. But before we sign off today, I want to mention that yesterday was Global Ethics Day. Um, and so uh, I, I know a lot of what we talked about were uh, for our leadership, uh, current leadership is asking them to think about ethics in their leadership roles and in their positions and both abroad and at home. And so I do want to give a shout out uh, to the Carnegie Council's Global Ethics Day, which was yesterday. Uh, very important because this week is also Global Free Speech Week. Um, so we'll be talking, of course, more about that and um, this idea of, of disinformation as we continue to watch the story of what is Iran really doing uh, in the election and how this is going to play out over the next couple of weeks. I want to thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, for joining us today. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Nick, and thank you to our listeners. Remember, um, if you have comments or questions, you can follow us at Carnegie Council or uh, tweet to me at Tatiana Serafin. Thanks for listening to The Doorstep, sponsored by the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. For more, go to carnegiecouncil.org. Stay healthy and safe.